first of all, I'd like to welcome you all in our small format conference, but outside of this room, there are many other uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, dear friends. Libmod, the center of liberal modernity, is still up and running. Although we were forced to work at home because of the corona crisis, we continued our work, and that is why we have the opportunity to meet today and we have two new topics on our gen agenda. Well, they're not so new anyway, but we have been working on that. And since we are talking about the three countries we have on our agenda today, we need to say first and foremost, they are on the way to become members of the EU. They're members and have association agreements. And so, unfortunately, we have the topic of corruption, rule of law, institutions, transparency, still on the agenda. And the other topic, of course, is going to be the topic of climate change and the requirement to change, to transit our ways of living, our production assets and uh, we have to find renewables. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Katja Kikalishvili. She has always told us, you talk about the Ukraine a lot, but don't forget about the others. There's still Georgia, there's still Moldova, and they are, they are very active and lively civil societies. They are experts, they are not just only people that have their private opinion. Let's get these people together. Those countries and those experts are supposed to be a triad because when we speak together, we are louder than just speaking on our own behalf. And uh, those countries are supposed to support one another on their path towards Brussels. And they need to show the members that those who are standing at our doorstep are part of our family. They have the right to join and we should be interested in them joining. Corruption is a topic that has been on our agenda as a focal topic for many years. I'm not going to talk about Ukraine in particular, but I think a key topic is still free media. We have been trying out various instruments, uh, but they can only work if there is an informed public civil society. Everybody understood that who's tried to come to grips with the country. The loss of credibility of uh, democracy is also very important when we look at our neighboring uh, countries. And we also have to talk about the credibility of the U European Union. And then we have the huge challenge of climate change and intelligent new and coordinated responses we need to give to climate change. And that is why we today have invited the experts from these countries. We would like to talk to them and we'd like to show how we can develop an impetus for modernization in these three countries. I would like to thank you for coming here today. Let me first and foremost say thanks to the interpreters right away at the beginning, and uh, now we are going to start immediately. Going to introduce our long-term friend, Matthias Lüttenberg, who is the Director for Eastern Europe of the Federal Foreign Office. So he's in charge of uh, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia, and he agreed to join us today. And we can say that over many years, we have been in touch with him and he has always uh, fought for making Europe the big continent it used to be uh, some time ago. So this is uh, a thing that is very close to his heart. So we are looking forward to his introductory words. Thank you very much, uh, dear Marie, ladies and gentlemen both here in the room and at home at uh, Excellencies. I'm very happy to be invited and uh, speak to you today. I'm very happy to say that LibMods, the Centre for Liberal Modernity, is so active and focuses on this topic of uh, the Eastern neighbourhood. 
I'm also very happy that we have a close cooperation between the center and the foreign office ever since the Eastern Partnership program was started when Michael Siebert was still chair of my department. Many colleagues from the foreign office have uh, been regular guests at events of uh, the uh, LibMod Center. This project makes a major and important contribution. Today we are going to introduce uh, papers and today we're going to have discussions that will be very interesting. So I'm going to limit myself to just a few words. What is uh, the situation we have as we are approaching the summit? And uh, I also would like to say a few words about uh, the rule of law. After many postponements, uh, we now have a date for the sixth summit, of the Eastern Partnership. It will take place on the 15th of uh, December in Brussels. People have been preparing for that event for over two years now. The Foreign Service and the Commission have developed a very good inclusive consultation process embracing both the member states and the Eastern Partnership countries and they also included civil society. The input of everybody involved in the consultation process brought about convincing common communications regarding the future structure of the Eastern Partnership. In July this year, in order to operationalize this strategy, another joint staff working document was adopted. It outlines uh, concrete goals. There is the to top 10 targets for 2025 as follow-up uh, indicators for the 2020 indicators. And there's also an investment and uh, business and economic plan. The complex structure of multilateral partnerships, Eastern partnerships, is to be transformed into two pillars. One will embrace uh, econ economy and sustainability, and the other pillar will be de dedicated to good governance and rule of law. Next to many expert meetings, we are going to have a council of a council meeting of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the partner countries and the EU countries and to prepare for the summit. And they are going to focus on a joint declaration to be endorsed by all the countries. Uh, Belarus has uh, declared they would not like to participate in the summit. As you know, the regime in Minsk, uh, because of the EU sanction, has suspended its uh, membership in this uh, Eastern Partnership structure. But we are looking at how the Eastern Partnership could create an added value for people living in Belarus. And that is why we would like to keep the uh, Belarusian society involved. We are going to have a parallel event, event during the summit meeting to talk about how civil society can continue to be in touch. And we are also going to uh, look at how the three associated countries, uh, Georgia, Moldova and the Ukraine, will be able to deepen their relationship. We uh, in want to intensify our relations with those partners who would like to have a closer cooperation with the EU. In the association agreements, we have uh, such provisions. The six partners are individually shaping their own commitment in the Eastern Partnership, and their level of ambition is very different. But uh, it is and remains important for us that the Eastern Partnership does not only have three partnership nations, and uh, we insist on that. We are not going to close the door on any one. We might be opening new doors and uh, those will be open doors for other partners to join if they are willing and ready to do so. Now allow me to talk about the second aspect of my introductory speech. When we made a contribution to the consultation uh, process, the German government has focused on uh, good governance as one of the central elements of our partnership cooperation. In the last 10 years we made progress when it comes to economic cooperation and uh, more mobility. As far as the rule of law is concerned, uh, we have a much more sober balance. Uh, as far as uh, good governance, uh, judicial reform and uh, combating corruption is concerned, uh, we still have a lot to do. We need to take more efforts and this is inevitable when it comes to also opening new fields of cooperation. As far as corruption is concerned and judicial reform is concerned, in many partnership countries, it, of course, we have to. Uh, people have to overcome the, the resistance in their 
domestic policy arena. And that is why it is so important for us to um, support those forces in the countries that are willing to undergo reform. And that is what we are doing. We focus on uh, good governance and uh, rule of law, and we are going to support projects. And secondly, we also show that progress in the field of rule of law would be a prerequisite for a widening of our cooperation beyond the association agreements. And thirdly, we also want to create opportunities uh, to be able to enable uh, to be able to carry out a better monitoring to find out where we still need to provide more support where are the uh, weaknesses and it is also a basis for conditionality and uh, an implementation process that will be focused on a step-by-step -step approach. So I'm looking forward to the expert deliberations and the discussions. Thank you for your attention. There are some people I'd like to introduce. There was somebody who over 30 years has supported the Ukraine and Central and Eastern Europe in general. And uh, this is Rebecca. And we are absolutely happy that she has come to our office and uh, she is a senior advisor. She's going to be the facilitator today. And uh, she also did the work together with Katja. So Rebecca, you have the floor now. Thank you, Marie. Now we are removing the rostrum for our discussion so that you can see us. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this project as a consultant. It was great, a great pleasure for me to work with Katja and the LibMod team and all the experts in the three association countries. We have talked about the strategy papers, we have discussed them and before I know announce the next presentation, allow me to also say a few words to the diplomats and Mr. Luttenberg here. I do have one wish when I look at the project that we have conducted so far. My wish is that Berlin should uh, be an impulse, an incentive for the summit to come. There is such a lot of willingness and readiness in the associated countries. And I hope very much that our strategy paper will be able to provide some meaningful support. Having said this, I know, first of all, would like to introduce a number of people that you might already know. We have uh, Katarina Matanova. She is the Vice Director General of the Directorate General that is in charge of the Eastern European Partnership Policy and the enlargement negotiations. As uh, the Vice Director General, she has a huge portfolio. I think this is another proof for big possibilities um, in between Berlin and Brussels. Hello, Katharina. Well, first, uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me and, and it feels very good to be surrounded by the friends of Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova. And as we always say, friends are always honest with each other. So we are also very honest with our partners and sometimes uh, are giving criticism, but overall uh, supporting our partners in their, in their reform endeavors. I was uh, uh, very happy to see the, 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 the activity and the ideas and the direction uh, through which the two papers are looking at really at two of the key cornerstones of our partnership, both the uh, rule of law as well as the green transition, which really are at the center of our engagement uh, with our partners. The, the green agenda is more of a, of a of a new topic. It's something that uh, I think is now dawning on all of us in Europe and worldwide, just how much we need to accelerate our activity to, to, to sustain as a, as a race on this, uh, on this uh, and humanity on this earth. Um, the rule of law agenda is uh, of somewhat longer 
sustenance with, uh, with in our dialogue. It's something that has been at the at the core, at the heart, both of the enlargement agenda and the Eastern Partnership agenda now for a number of years, and it because it's still as relevant as relevant as uh, as ever. Uh, and when we talk about rule of law, as you point out, it's a very broad uh, uh, concept covering everything from the judiciary to uh, competitive elections. I'm looking at Mikhail, who is still either in Georgia or just back from uh, just back from Georgia, uh, uh, being an observer at the at the most recent hotly contested elections at the regional level, and. And, and really establishing a system where citizens can rely on access to justice and where, where uh, whether you are a powerful person or not are treated uh, equally uh, is, is, is really an important, important uh, one. And so I think that the, the approach you outlined in the papers is the, is the right one. And what we are trying to do is to support the countries and especially uh, the ones in the in the trio uh, among the the countries that are associate members Ukraine Moldova and Georgia by a combination of of instruments from political dialogue policy dialogue through uh, legal approximation which is a fairly challenging task for them to financial support, not to individual project as we used to do, but really to important reform agendas in the in the uh, partner countries, and uh, and that's something what we uh, what we try to do uh, really systematically, and uh, both praise uh, improvements where praise is merited and, you know, criticize backsliding when that happens, because I think we have learned by now one key lesson that uh, progress is not a linear function. There usually are several steps forward, several steps sideways, backwards. And, uh, and I think that it's really important that we understand that what we are demanding of our partner countries, whether it comes to the rule of law or whether it comes to the environmental agenda and the highest level of environmental protection that the EU espouses, we are asking these countries for major, major, major changes. Uh, orders of magnitude bigger changes than, than, than we are currently undergoing. And these changes are being uh, requested of countries that honestly don't have a realistic prospect right now of joining the European Union in any short-term horizon. And that makes the reform dynamics uh, much more complicated than in the country where I come from, which was going equally through very, very fundamental reforms in the 90s, but with very much a realistic prospect of joining the Union. And so I think that we need to um, really uh, look also at ourselves and at our demands and our aspirations and, and our both praise and criticism with a little bit of a, of a perspective on what kind of a geopolitical context we operate, uh, where is Europe right now, where is Europeans uh, 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 willingness or lack thereof to engage into discussions of, uh, of, uh, of future expansion and, 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 and therefore really for our own benefit and for stabilizing uh, and 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 having stable, prosperous, peaceful neighbors on our borders, which I believe is in our strong interest, we need to display strategic patience and an understanding of the of the domestic 
uh, difficulties that that uh, that we have, so that they have. So, I I personally look with a lot of understanding at the uh, desire of the three associated countries to to develop uh, a deeper and more comprehensive dialogue with us. In a number across a number of sectors, whether it's in the green agenda, for example, I'm co-chairing with the deputy prime minister of Ukraine a green deal dialogue with Ukraine, which really is becoming a forum where we can, on, in a very cross-sectoral way, discuss the the uh, huge demands that are being placed on. To, on uh, their industry, on their local authorities, on their national authorities, uh, based on the uh, really very progressive EU environmental legislation, but that comes with a with a huge cost. And while we will be very generously shouldering that for European enterprises, we are not as generous when it comes to our our partners. Uh, 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 needs to needs for the transformation. So I think we need to we need to really strike the right balance and 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 really have a dialogue and uh, and uh, uh, engagement with the three countries that allows us to uh, to uh, help them pursue the reforms, push them in the reform. Uh, agenda, whether we are talking about the rule of law or the uh, environmental agenda, and also support them uh, in it. So I personally, I think it was at one of the other events when somebody was saying that they don't see the trio as replacing the Eastern Partnership. We certainly would not be interested in replacing the inclusive framework of the Eastern Partnership, but I see the engagement with the associate countries uh, as something additional just because uh, we have the Eastern Partnership are now spanning even uh, much greater divergence among countries with Ukraine on the one hand and Belarus on the other than it was the case uh, just a year ago or two. So I think it's important that on the sectoral side we we really take full advantage of the association agreements and the uh, deep and comprehensive free trade areas. And I think uh, to take full advantage uh, requires action on both sides, not only homework for one. And I think these are such ambitious agreements written at, in a completely different uh, uh, geopolitical reality uh, to 12, 13 years ago that uh, to live up to them would actually uh, mean that we have a lot more um, integration, sectoral uh, 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 alignment with the partner countries that they could uh, benefit from. And, uh, and that could help overcome the, or, or address the, the domestic uh, uh, forces that are not, in favor of uh, the reforms uh, to to address them more effectively. So I will uh, stop here. Uh, thanks again for the invitation, and uh, I'm very happy to stay on for a little bit if there are any questions or or comments. Thank you very much, Katarina, to Brussels. And thank you very much uh, for the flexibility with uh, which you uh, pushed around uh, your agenda to fit into our agenda. So I'm not quite sure whether I'll, I'm going to have the possibility to pass the word back to you, but we have to continue uh, in the agenda and the centre today. We've got the introduction of the two strategy papers uh, that have been uh, developed on the two pillars uh, in which uh, the policy and the Eastern Partnership and uh, also the three associated countries are to be aligned. So um, it is the fight of corruption and the rule of law and then the Green New Deal for Europe and what does that mean in the three associated countries. So maybe 
uh, by way of introduction, before I pass over to Katja Kikalishvili, um, so the two papers are the result of a longer cooperation and the consultation with experts from the three associated countries. So they are going to comment on that later on, but what is important is that certain cornerstones that have been included, uh, they are from the countries themselves. For instance, a very strict suggestion of conditionality. So it, this is nothing that was invented in Berlin or in Brussels, but rather that is what the countries uh, insist on, the civic societies of these countries. They insist on that. So now the first strategy paper, Katja, uh, didn't only manage the project, but she also developed the uh, paper on strategy, um, the rule of law. for inviting me. And we have indeed worked with our colleagues from Georgia, from the Ukraine and Moldova. And what is the role of the European Union in and in Germany? We have worked with the countries over 30 years. And how about the instruments that were developed by the European sign? Uh, are they really used in the countries in order to efficiently combat corruption. I am going to speak about uh, a number of, not, not a, going to speak about all the details in the three association countries, because that would take too much time now. What I'm going to talk about is uh, the fact that these three countries are very different. When we talk about Georgia, we can say, yes, this country, has started in the early 2000s to, bat, to combat uh, small-scale corruption and uh, they were uh, effective. But we still have, according to Transparency International State Capture, so large-scale corruption is a problem and to keep uh, the investigation up when it comes to large-scale corruption, that is very difficult. And as far as Moldova is concerned, ever since 2009, we have seen continuous uh, efforts with the support of the EU, not only the EU, but the West in general, and their corruption, anti-corruption reforms were undertaken. And we all remember the bank fraud scandal, which aggravated the situation in Moldova. But on the other hand, as Rebecca said, in conditionality was introduced and there the EU policy was recalibrated when it comes to relations with Moldova. There we also uh, encountered uh, small scale and mid-level corruption, but also corruption amongst elites. And we had the problem of the lacking independence of uh, institutions. But now we have a very pro-European leadership in Moldova, and we hope very much that uh, the president, the minister of foreign affairs and other members of the go government will provide a major impetus. And they've made promises and they have uh, promised that they are going to tackle anti-corruption policies and uh, advance it. As far as the Ukraine is concerned, uh, the Ukraine has undertaken major impressive reforms in recent years. Gold, and they have developed golden standards, but even their civil society and the different institutions have to fight to remain independent of the political elites. And in order to be successful in that respect, we need a strong civil society. One can say in the Ukraine, they do have such a civil society that is very active. They have achieved a lot in terms of anti-corruption institutions and their development, but we also need political will. And when I say this, let me add that this is a very important item. Generally, when we talk about anti-corruption policy, rule of law and reforms, when I wrote this paper, I looked very closely at conditionality and does it really have an effect? That is to say, the suspension of macro-financial 
aid, will that have a long-term effect or does it only have a short-term effect? What is decisive for reforms to be sustainable? I know I'm not telling you anything new when I say that. My conclusion was it is political will that has to be there. If there's a lack of pol political will, we can do whatever we want here in Europe, in civil society. Uh, we can work hard for making institutions free and independent so that uh, governors and uh, directors of those institutions will be elected in a fair and transparent process. But without political will, it's all not possible. Let me add one more thing. I know I don't have much, much time. We do have nine recommendations that we have uh, put on paper for the benefit of the German government. And those uh, recommendations are common recommendations for all three countries, not only for one of them. And uh, uh, our recommendation number one is uh, make our Eastern partnership stronger. And uh, we have recommended the German government to take the leads and rally other European EU member states around us to work towards association agreements and uh, also make anti-corruption and reform policies a more precise policy and also install, introduce more control instruments. And the EU, uh, Eastern Partnership always has been a geopolitical project. Some people forget about that. Uh, we do have the Russian factor. We have uh, geopolitics, which are important in the light of the Eastern Partnership. And if the reforms do not make progress, then we should never lose our strategic patience anyway. Germany should be an active uh, participant in the region. We should be more committed and more motivated when it comes to our work on the ground in the three countries. Thank you, Katja. Conditionality was a topic already mentioned and we were quite uh, involved in the conditionality debate. I've always said political will is paramount. And you can never achieve anything just merely from the outside. Uh, of course, the question is, to who do you talk to? And what are, is the situation on the ground when Mr. Zachmann joined us and developed the paper regarding the Green Deal? We immediately uh, came back to this issue. We always kept asking ourselves, what has to be done in the country so that the major ideas that were addressed by Katarina Matanova could be rooted in such a diverse and difficult situation and uh, in order to have a chance to implement the Green Deal and in order to use uh, the available money instead of uh, burning it for nothing. So we need to have a few prerequisites. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your invitation. And I also would like to thank the co-authors who've written the paper together with me. Lucas and Rubens are here. And the other colleague who worked with us in, is in Paris at the moment. What I want to say is an effective climate diplomacy is possible. And these triad countries would be a wonderful testing ground to show how a strategically integrated climate diplomacy can be implemented. Well, you have to ask yourself, first of all, what does Europe want to achieve. I mean, we have the European uh, Green Deal, which is a major challenge. We have said we would like to develop uh, technologies where we'd be market leaders. We'd like to sell those technologies later to other countries. And we hope we will be able to provide the instruments, the tools that we need to stay below a two degree global warming goal. Uh, Katarina Matanova talked about uh, patience, but uh, we do not have much time. We need efficient and fast responses. Now, Europe alone cannot achieve the goals. Uh, having less than 10% of the global emissions and uh, we need to act now. We need to be active beyond the boundaries of the EU, we need to be active outside the EU. And our neighborhood is the ideal uh, field for us, Europe and uh, Germany to take responsibility in those uh, regions. And the EU has strong tools 
and funds in order to conduct successful diplomacy in the countries. The markets in the three countries and the other countries of the uh, neighborhood are strongly focused on the EU anyway. Uh, we have now the carbon border adjustment mechanism discussion and how the countries would have uh, would uh, react. We have the free trade agreements. We have quota. We quotas we negotiate. We also have our in infrastructural links and ties. Here, the EU has a lot of leverage to close or open the markets. We have massive financial supports. That also is a leverage when we talk about uh, conditionality, and conditionality always means positive and negative in incentives. And there's also the will of the countries to uh, align with European laws because one day they'd like to be as close as possible to the EU. And that is, uh, provides us with some legal leverage. And we also have institutions such as the energy community that can play a meaningful role as an institutional mediator of the whole process. What's interesting to note is that the region has uh, similar problems. When I talk about the uh, region, I'll talk about the three countries uh, predominantly, but there are also other countries around in that area that have similar problems. Uh, old uh, capital assets, energy intensity is too high, uh, lots of emissions. On the other hand, uh, they are independent in terms of they are dependent in terms of uh, energy supplies dependent on a partner that is politically not reliable we see in many countries very weak institutions which is a major problem for the green deal because what we need is investment for long periods uh, for 20 to 40 years for that purpose we need uh, low capital costs and in order to get that you need functioning uh, institutions and not only oligarchs to try to cling to their old system and make as much money as they can well, we also see and we need to recognize uh, the fact that climate uh, policy is not very high as a political uh, priority on the agenda. And so they need more support in that respect, those countries. And we also see that there are differences between the three, the, the three or even more countries when it comes to policy priorities. I mean, there's the steel industry in the Ukraine, a huge emitter. Uh, steel industry doesn't exist in the other countries. We have hydropower in Georgia, which has a huge potential that other countries do not have. What we propose is that the EU uses an integrated approach and says, okay, let's take all the information that we have regarding the problems, regarding the leverage that we have, and let's try to combine it all into one program. A strategic program designed to assist the countries and designed to help us with the Green Deal. We have identified three elements. Capacity building is element number one. We have traveled a lot to the Ukraine and the other countries, me and my colleagues, and we noticed that the intellectual perception of decarbonization, uh, transition of energy systems is still limited. Also, the political interest uh, regarding decarbonization is too low. And uh, of course, we need to do a lot. Uh, um, Agora, the Agora program for energy would be very well designed for those countries. Now, then I think our recommendation number two would be to have a strategic conditionality. That is to say, access to big programs should be made dependent on strategic decisions taken in the countries themselves. And here we think the EU and the member states should co-finance a CO2 fund in the country as a matching fund, that is to say, if the Ukraine, due to CO2 income, get, gets 100 grievna, the EU would contribute another euro. So such a matching fund could develop a major project for programs. There would be money to use it, and the Ukraine would be motivated to introduce a CO2 price. That would solve already 90% of the project, uh, problem or would help us to develop the right path. The third element would be tactical conditionality, which means that we help institutional, institutionally that when they spend their money from the climate funds, uh, they would spend it wisely based on good governance and due diligence structures and within the framework of the law. All of that should be then done in order to develop develop good programs for the countries. Um, the overall paper is 20 pages long, so there will be much more information there. At the end of my statement, allow me to say that all of that 
is integrated. It's not just a magic uh, crystal ball where we say, okay, do that, give the country some money and it will work. We have uh, developed an integrated approach that needs constant uh, support, constant supervision, political, con institutional and intellectual potential. So uh, here Germany and Europe have to work together. My experience is that oftentimes we just think about financial support and we do not uh, or have in the past not enough thought about other forms of support. So the Green Deal would be very much in the German interest and would promise a lot of uh, success stories. If uh, that happens, even those three countries with good prerequisites can indeed develop a meaningful progressive structure, then that could be a uh, showcase for other countries. There are also other countries that have similar problems and very large emissions, uh, countries that reach up to the Indian subcontinent. So what we do here could be a uh, pilot project. We have to accept it. We have to assume more risks, try out new things. And if we do that, then probably we can also have an effect on the wider environment. Thank you, Mr. Zuckman. If you read that paper, you will notice that in that Green Deal, there are enormous opportunities, not just for climate protection, uh, it's also a major potential for urgently required investments, not only in the energy sector, but also in uh, the industry of the three countries. And when you read the paper, you will also notice there is a lot of potential for more security because then we could overcome the deep level of uh, energy dependency on Russia. And we have this dependency in all the three countries for the time being. And you would also notice when you read that paper that classical environmental topics can be solved, like the enormous air pollution that is a problem for the three countries. And all of that could be a major incentive for the countries to join and be active there. I think Georg Zachmann and his team has shown very well that in spite of the opportunities, we should not rush it. We should go step by step. So probably capacity building comes first. Competences should be developed. Institutions should be strengthened. And I think this is very much a central demand made in that paper. This paper was also developed on the basis of recommendations coming from the Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova. And this is how we move now to our experts, experts that have given us an input at the beginning of our project. And here, our first speaker, our first ex will be Alexander Sushko. He's the executive director of the International Renaissance Foundation uh, and their office in Kiev. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for taking part in this uh, very timely event. Thank you for the Center for Liberal Modernity for organizing for this initiative. Uh, we are really looking forward towards, towards the summit, towards the new elements of the Eastern Partnership, which is embracing new uh, dimensions when it comes to the uh, climate policy, energy policy. And also this is a big challenge, how the EU together with three associated countries will be able to adjust their strategies in order to make this existing framework more efficient, more capable to deal with the current challenges. We have heard a lot from various audiences in, in uh, Ukraine and in the neighboring countries that, uh, um, that um, Eastern partnership maybe is is uh, not the best framework when it comes to the uh, ultimate objectives of Ukraine, 
and uh, the its relationships with the European Union. However, everybody acknowledge the fact that due to the Eastern Partnership, we have additional, we have received an additional motivation for closer engagement with our neighbors. And first of all, with Moldova and Georgia, who have very similar contractual relationship with the European Union, the association agreement, energy community, visa liberalization, and many other elements of the policy which make us closer. Certainly, this is there is no autom automatic connection between the three countries, even if they acknowledge the common interests, if they acknowledge the need of, of uh, collective or the multilateral uh, policies, um, which may streamline their their uh, their relationships with the European Union. At the same, so I understand that there are many challenges ahead, and uh, the initiative of uh, what we call associated trio, three countries working together in order to push forward their more more ambitious agenda, their idea of. Uh, full integration into European Union is is at stake, and uh, I understand that there is a the good um, time. Now we are exactly in the middle of the time frame of association agreement, which I just can recall you, which was signed for a ten years period at least. Its term is fixed in Ukrainian agreement. And now we are exactly in the middle of this way. And now it's a good time to look carefully on what really happened, what accomplishment we may identify, which uh, short shortages or the deficits we may detect in the way of implementation of association agreement. And now I see that there is a growing interest on the thing of the think tanks, uh, both in Ukraine and uh, in the European Union. And here I fully appreciate the uh, Libmod um, input, and I read with with big interest the papers which were just introduced to the audiences. And now it's really it's really the good time to see what works well and what probably needs changes when we see when we look at the strategic perspective of uh, the relationships between the eastern neighbors of the eu and the european union itself so certainly there is a big uh, challenge uh, because uh, there is no not an easy uh, way to to for both for european union and for for its neighbors, and we see how uh, how dramatic some events, which we observe now, and the, especially all these debates about the future of the European Union, and also we have uh, not an easy process of perception of the European Union initiatives in neighboring countries. For example, even when it comes to the Green Deal there is no just uniform perception of what it is about. And the European Union needs really to take additional efforts to undertake efforts in order to communicate the substance of this deal, uh, which is probably, which should bring more development in the neighborhood and not to be additional burden for, for the neighbors uh so so th there are lots of things to do and i think that the uh, so we are uh, here to to share our expertise and on my side on the international renaissance foundation i would just ensure that we are uh committed we are working together and we will be ready to contribute this discussion 
in the future and also to, to consolidate expertise, independent knowledge in Ukraine and abroad in order to make our policy proposals more coherent, complex, competent, and in the end, more efficient. Thank you. So, thank you very much to Kiev and Alexander. The next comment uh, on the paper now comes from Georgia, and we've got Ivan Shikvatsi. Shikvatsi, I hope I'm pro uh, pronouncing it properly. So, and uh, he is in charge. Uh, of as a program manager of the EU integration, and that is in the Open Society Foundation in Georgia. So, so it's over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. And I just want to also greet our uh, participants uh, and uh, want to stress that it's uh, our pleasure uh, to cooperate with uh, LibMod to implement this very interesting project to reach out to uh, the policymakers in Berlin and not only in Berlin, also in Brussels and other capitals um, uh, and to discuss on the uh, future of uh, the uh, Eastern Partnership. Um, uh, let me uh, divide my intervention in, in three parts as it was already uh, agreed with the moderator. Uh, the first one would be, um, would be about the uh, corruption as, it, uh, uh, as we know the paper uh, focuses on the corruption. The second one would be about the economy and the, of course uh, green economy. And then last uh, point would be about the expectations uh, uh, when it comes to the Eastern Partnership, upcoming Eastern Partnership uh, Summit. Uh, so, starting from the uh, from the corruption part, uh, as it is uh, uh, also highlighted in the uh, in the paper, I just want to reiterate actually that uh, uh, Georgia can boast of uh, uh, certain achievements when it comes to the uh, petty corruption. And basically, uh, Georgia uh, is the uh, country which is uh, uh, which is successfully managed to fight against the petty corruption. And it was uh, largely done after the Rose Revolution, uh, reforming the state institutions um, uh, and those uh, agencies which are providing services, uh, decreasing the uh, number of uh, licenses and permits, and also introducing the uh, one-stop shop approaches when it comes to the issuing licenses and permits. Um, also, um, uh, there was a great achievement of the, uh, of the uh, policy reform. Uh, and I have to also say that there is a sustainability of this reform. So uh, uh, this uh, fight against pet corruption um, uh, is still in place. And Georgia is performing, uh, is one of the best performing countries uh, among the uh, states of the former um, Soviet Union. However, uh, uh, there is a huge challenge when it comes to the uh, elite corruption um, in the country. And when it comes to the elite corruption, one of the biggest challenges is the lack of the political will actually to deal and to tackle effectively the high level corruption and the, uh, and the perpetrators. Um, uh, so far, despite the fact that uh, civil society organizations have been uh, calling for the establishing the independent agency to fight against corruption, we don't see that uh, this agency is in place in the, uh, in the country. All the more, uh, there's a huge uh, challenge and problem related to the independence of, of, of judiciary. Civil society organizations, again, are very critical uh, of the current state uh, of the uh, uh, judiciary of, of, of the country. And uh, step by step, we do see the very clear and very visible uh, uh, signs of the state capture, which means that the private interests actually are significantly influencing the uh, state decision-making process uh, to the advantage of the, uh, of, of the individuals here in the country. And uh, last but not least, um, unfortunately, we don't see much pushing uh, uh, coming from our partners when it comes to the, uh, uh, to the fight against elite corruption. It's, uh, uh, it was always kind of a topic which was uh, tabooed uh, in the international uh, reports, but uh, gradually in the last couple of years, we do see that the uh, there is a uh, special statement, a special mentioning of the elite corruption 
um, in the reports uh, produced by the European Parliament, as well as also the uh, European, uh, European Commission. Um, my second uh, part of my intervention is, is linked to the, uh, uh, to the uh, economy and the green economy. Um, unfortunately, I have to uh, say that despite the fact that um, the CFTA, a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement uh, that Georgia has with the European Union is in place already for seven years, uh, it still is not, there's no breakthrough when it comes to the EU-Georgia um, uh, trade. All the more, according to the uh, latest statistics, we see that uh, up to 65% of Georgian export actually uh, goes to China, Russia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Ukraine, um, and, uh, and Armenia. And China actually, according to the latest data, is the top destination of the Georgian export, uh, uh, which, is, which accounts uh, uh, up to 16% of the total export of the country. Um, and uh, when it comes to the specifically on the, on the, on the uh, energy and on the green economy, we see that uh, dependence on Russia actually um, uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, electricity import, is uh, is increasing. Uh, it reached uh, 35 percent uh, uh, in last year, and also um, despite the fact that there is a um, there is a uh, pretty high investment compared to the overall uh, overall figures uh, going to the energy sector, uh, there are still a lot of uh, challenges of of uh, of reforming the uh, energy sector in the country. Um, as you know, uh, large-scale hydropower stations are not uh, uh, constructing due to the, uh, I would say, poor communication between the society and the government also, as well as the uh, opposition com coming from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the population. When it comes to the um, Eastern Partnership su uh, Summit, and I would like to uh, kind of uh, sum up here, um, I have to be very frank that there's no high expectations to the upcoming uh, summit, which is, which is scheduled in uh, in December here in the, um, among the civil society, among my, uh, my colleagues. And this is very much linked to uh, uh, those documents which we already have seen. Uh, now I here mean the uh, staff working document which was published in July uh, this month, uh, the, this year, sorry. And uh, when it comes to the uh, specific chapters and specific topics related to the uh, judiciary, uh, unfortunately, those targets which are identified in the documents are not those which would be uh, a best, the best remedy to uh, deal with the uh, corruption challenges and, uh, and, and uh, uh, judiciary here in the country. For example, the document says that the success of the reforms of the judiciary will be judged on the basis of the increase in the level of public trust in the independence of judiciary. And I don't think that and nobody here in the civil society thinks that they, uh, this is the best indicator to measure the success of the, of the uh, justice reform here uh, in the country. Or uh, it says that there is a, the target is establishing the independent training institution uh, to deal with the uh, with justice sector. And I have to reiterate that actually European Union invested dozens of millions of euro to reform the judiciary in this country, investing in uh, uh, in training of the, of the judges, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but unfortunately, it was not really uh, was not really successful. But still, when it comes to the uh, expectations and the wishes that we have uh, when it comes to the um, EAP summit, I think that first and the foremost, Eastern Partnership requires deep and comprehensive reform, because keeping it as it is now, I don't think that it would be. Uh, efficient and it would be the, meet the expectations of those ambitious countries which we have uh, there. Second, uh, there is an urgent need of differentiation and treating differently those countries which has much more ambitious and uh, aspirations in a long run to join the European Union. Thirdly, uh, I think that there is a huge need of, uh, of uh, conditionality principle. And that should be uh, very strictly applied to the countries because unfortunately we do have the experience of Georgia, which used to be the best people in the class. But at the end of the day, we, we, we find out that actually there are a lot of, lot of challenges and, and problems in the country uh, and we should not turn the blind eye to those, um, uh, to those issues. Uh, another one and uh, very- Herr Vatrasima, and this is also very important. 
just to have the access to the uh, EU programs and EU programmes and to EU Behörden and uh, Agenturen. Und hier äh, brauchen wir auch ein äh, Prinzip des gleichen Zugangs und schließlich und endlich ist das Wichtigste für die Ostpartnerschaft, dass wir uns ganz stark konzentrieren auf Menschenrechtsfragen und die Justizreform. An dieser Stelle gestatten Sie mir, dass ich zunächst erstmal ende und äh, gerne äh, spreche ich dann in der weiteren Diskussion noch einmal. Thank you very much also for your critical remarks uh, and uh, the criticism that came from Tbilisi. I think we have a lot of things to be discussed. And I do understand that at the moment the mood in Tbilisi is quite tense. But I think we have to, uh, everybody understands that in Brussels uh, in the run up to the summit. Now, we would like to continue in our program and we'd like to hand over to Victoria Rosa. She's the senior ex associate expert at the S Society of International Policies in Moldova. And then Mr. Lutenberg will continue. All right. You have the floor, Victoria Rosa. Yes, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you very much for the Center for Liberal Modernity for the opportunity to uh, address to our distinguished uh, audience and uh, guests today. Uh, I will uh, reflect more on the situation in the Republic of Moldova, uh, taking into account the perspective of the topics that uh, have been uh, uh, presented today when it comes to judicial reform, anti-corruption, the uh, Green Deal, or the climate diplomacy uh, and uh, also the future priorities of the Eastern Partnership, um, uh, mostly uh, the expectations of, uh, of the Eastern Partnership uh, countries, uh, mostly uh, when it comes to, to Moldova. Um, if referring to anti-corruption and what was said uh, previously, um, I think that um, uh, from the very beginning uh, we uh, talked about the lack of credibility, uh, but also the lack of credibility also in the European Union when uh, it comes to the audience of, uh, uh, of the three associated countries. Countries. And I must say that indeed this was uh, a challenge, but at the same time uh, it, uh, it became from uh, a challenge a great advantage because what we see now in Moldova is that from the lack of uh, credibility we turned into a credit of credibility which was granted for, uh, for the new political elite in the Republic of Moldova. And now, uh, as you know, we have uh, invested a new president, a new parliament, a new government, which has a very clear uh, agenda, uh, uh, which is based actually on fighting uh, corruption, but also uh, reforming the judiciary. Uh, what it is uh, mentioned uh, uh, on uh, the uh, domestic, but also uh, foreign policy agenda of the Republic of Moldova is that only um, fight, by fighting uh, corruption, but also investing in the judicial reform, we can actually open uh, the door uh, for uh, Moldova's development, uh, be it institutionally, but also as an actor uh, on the international arena and uh, an actor which can contribute uh, actually as being a global uh, a global citizen. Uh, these are uh, one of the main points uh, which were actually presented by uh, our current president Maya Sandu in her vision uh, of the Moldova's uh, foreign policy. And this is uh, actually very important for us now uh, because we found uh, ourselves in a moment when we do have the political will uh, to do the reforms and uh, we have to uh, act very quickly and at the same time we understand and when it comes to, to reforms uh, of such uh, uh, domains as uh, anti-corruption and judiciary this is not a reform that is taking uh, place overnight this is why we really need to have patience but also a very practical and long-term dialogue with uh, our partners European Union being 
being one of them. So practically, this should be uh, one of the topics uh, that should uh, actually uh, be uh, a main topic on uh, the cooperation agenda uh, with the European Union, but also with the European uh, member states uh, individually. Uh, we understand very good uh, and very well uh, that uh, the anti-corruption uh, uh, agenda and also the judiciary reform, this is a long-term fight uh, and it also tackles some other very sensitive issues like uh, the oligarchization but also the state capture uh, issue and uh, this is uh, going to um, take uh, uh, a lot of uh, efforts but also uh, will really rely on the credibility of the population because it will entail uh, very uh, hard reforms uh, that will also uh, have to be uh, understood but also taken over and applied by the citizens of, uh, of the Republic of, uh, of Moldova. Uh, this also implies uh, a lot of efforts and um, uh, uh, also um, assistance uh, when it comes to our cooperation with the European Union in capacity building, but also institutional reforms. Moldova will really need a lot of assistance in this regard, and we know that uh, it was granted before. Uh, but now it's uh, uh, a situation uh, when the um, Republic of Moldova is starting all over again. Uh, and this time uh, it starts with uh, genuine political will uh, from the side of the presidency, from the side of the government, but also from the side uh, uh, of, the, of the parliament, uh, which is a great asset compared to, to, the, previous, uh, to the previous period. Uh, what I also wanted to mention uh, is the fact that uh, indeed when it comes to the climate diplomacy, when it comes to the Green Deal, uh, this is a topic um, which is new for, uh, for our countries and uh, indeed it needs uh, a lot of uh, explanation, uh, but also it needs very clear provisions. Uh, which should be taken over by uh, the countries. Because when uh, a country is facing uh, such difficulties uh, uh, which uh, regard rule of law but also good governance, uh, it is really important to explain uh, both, uh, the to, both to the political elites but also to the population itself uh, for what uh, it is needed and what benefits will it uh, will it bring. I want to mention that um, uh, the uh, Green Deal but also the climate diplomacy uh, is actually one of the uh, main points which is also promoted uh, by our presidential institution and uh, you will um, see it in uh, the discourses of our president but also in the discourses uh, of our Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, which are very much engaged uh, in uh, promoting uh, a dialogue on this, uh, on this topic but also considers uh, it an important issue uh, on, uh, on our foreign policy agenda and it is actually uh, one of the issues that could make uh, Moldova a good uh, global citizen. Uh, and I think that this is actually the argument that can be put forward in order to attract also the popularity uh, of the population uh, for, for this topic, uh, because we don't want to be only a country which is receiving assistance, but also a country which could contribute internationally, but also globally. And uh, definitely uh, Moldova needs to find uh, this kind of uh, topics where it can be of uh, help and uh, of uh, use. When it comes to the future of the Eastern Partnership, but also the topics that uh, uh, should be taken uh, on board uh, in the future. I think that, um, first of all, we have to, uh, to also take into account that uh, uh, if we're talking about the countries of the associated trio, all the three countries are facing conflicts. Uh, and uh, the agenda, um, the domestic agenda of the country uh, is uh, uh, um, willingly or not influenced uh, by, the, uh, by these conflicts and uh, the internal uh, security situation, uh, which also creates a, a regional uh, architecture as such. 
this is why I consider that uh, when we are talking about corruption, when we are talking about rule of law, whether we are talking about uh, different other topics that we should uh, include in the cooperation with the European Union, uh, such as, for example, um, uh, energy, uh, digital transformation or uh, um, transport, we have to take into account uh, that uh, the, the problems that the countries are facing internally and how how this uh, will affect um, uh, the uh, security situation of the country and uh, and not only. So um, I think that this is something that um, sometimes is missing from the dialogue, uh, but it should be uh, one of the um, main uh, issues to be uh, taken on board when we are discussing uh, the future uh, of the cooperation with the associated trio and the security uh, agenda uh, should be uh, in the in the focus. Um, at the end of my intervention, I would like to mention that indeed uh, there should be we should uh, stay uh, very strict with the conditionalities. Uh, as, uh, um, as this is something that uh, did help uh, both civil society uh, to, uh, to monitor the reform agenda of the countries, but also helped our partners to, um, uh, to uh, maintain, but also to um, influence uh, uh, the right agenda. Uh, when it comes to uh, the reforms uh, in the judiciary, but also in the anti-corruption sector. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we should also think about flexibility uh, and uh, distinguishing uh, between uh, the interests of the countries, but also their desire to uh, become, uh, to have a greater um, um, cooperation with the European Union and also their desires to, uh, on a longer term, integrate in the European Union. So from this perspective, I think that the countries should uh, uh, get a clear vision uh, but also, uh, if it is not possible to give at this point a, um, a perspective for, for joining the European uh, Union, at least there should be um, a clear vision uh, for the next period of time uh, of a closer uh, political uh, cooperation, but also uh, a closer institutional cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, thank you very much, um, Victoria Rosa. So I think um, during this summit and also beforehand, uh, we're going to discuss about the membership perspective. Uh, and uh, however, we're not going to uh, go into detail there uh, tonight on this subject, but I know amongst the audience, uh, both uh, on site as well as online, are in favor of a membership perspective. But um, we believe that uh, concrete steps of integration, as for instance, in the energy sector or other sectors, uh, that can be very helpful. So how this, uh, what this could look like and what it looks like from a Brussels perspective and the Berlin perspective is something we're going to discuss now with Mr. Lüttenberg once more who is going to introduce uh, the perspective of the Foreign Office and the Berlin perspective and two MPs of the European Parliament. Um, so one I know already very well from my work in uh, Brussels, Michel Gala. I um, experienced a lot with him in Eastern Partnership. And uh, the second uh, MP that we've got is um, also a colleague of mine, however, not from the European Parliament uh, when I was there, but uh, from the Greens party and uh, from Berlin, from the Heinrich Böll uh, Stiftung, uh, Sergei Lagodinsky. So if you are okay with it, Mr. Lüttenberg, I would first like to hand over to Brussels to Mr. Gala. He is uh, a member of the Europäische Volkspartei and uh, especially after leaving, uh, after Emma Brock leaving, he's one of the most prominent representatives of the interests 
of Eastern Europe in uh, Brussels. Michel, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, dear Rebecca, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, so I also say uh, hello uh, for the Ukrainian and the Georgians and uh, also hello, I think, is for Romanian in Moldova. So I'm very happy that uh, I have this opportunity and uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, the Center for Liberal Modernity for this seminar and also for the work um, that uh, they have uh, uh, conducted with the strategy papers, with the balance of uh, fighting corruption also and above all, with the recommendations for action to the uh, policymakers in Germany. So I do believe indeed that um, we've got occasion to uh, give the three associated members more attention and also to uh, open up more opportunities. So. I was in uh, Georgia yesterday. Um, I've just returned from Moldova uh, yesterday, so from uh, the elections. So, with what was said with regard to Georgia, so state capture, this is something that is uh, noticeable there. So, uh, the uh, oligarch uh, Ivanashvili in the background uh, pulling the strings, um, he uh, rules and uh, his party. Also in the election campaign, we saw that quite clearly. So I'm just asking, is this a public uh, event or is it uh, within the framework we're invited? So is it World Wide Web where I'm talking or what is it? Can someone tell me? So I just tried, I just tried to answer Michael. So it is public and we've also got diplomats uh, from the three associated countries here. Uh, the ambassador of Georgia, for instance, who I would like to welcome, who's uh, just uh, arrived somewhat belatedly. Okay, so within the framework of the OSCE, uh, they gave their statement and it doesn't say the sentence so clearly as I said it just now, but I believe that um, in those who know the country, it is uh, the opinion that um, there is a pretty uh, large dominance of this gentleman in all the important affairs. Um, so at the same time, however, so at this point, I don't want to go too much into detail about Georgia, but rather somewhat more general, um, also address the Berlin uh, policymakers. So in these three countries, we see a broad political consensus in the government as well as opposition with regard to the European orientation. So these three countries say, we want to become members. And it's good that they say it, and it's right that they say it, and at least that we acknowledge this. And I'm also aware of the fact that, uh, let's say that uh, apart from Article 49 and the uh, treaties of Rome, we've got a uh, possibility of uh, membership of all European countries. So uh, be going beyond that, um, we uh, so the uh, countries of the Eastern Partnership have not been offered the membership yet. However, still, and I uh, believe that for these countries, um, we've got the Eastern Partnership for 10 years now, and we've also achieved uh, something, and uh, I don't want to, uh, I need to list achievements. Uh, so the um, those uh, who are attending know of all these achievements, and uh, but at the same time, I believe that um, the next 10 years uh, of the Eastern Partnership uh, will not uh, be uh, seen as a, a repeat of the first 10 years. No, rather that we have to undertake to um, open up the perspective, to expand the perspective uh, politically, also with regard to the fact that other stakeholders also the undesired, uh, so like Russia, for instance, uh, but more and more also China, especially when you look at geographically where George is located. So in the Central Asian countries uh, and the Caspian Sea, the land uh, bridge to the Black Sea, Turkey and Europe. Uh, so China is going to um, become uh, more involved, uh, but these countries uh, voluntarily have um, 
agreed on this European orientation and they committed themselves. And in part, they also put that into their constitutions. So that's the one point. And the other point is that um, with uh, the transitions that we see in many uh, parts of the country, uh, the world actually, also with regard to the United States, as well as the Russian behavior that we've got, I believe we've got all, every occasion to uh, also, so I, that's how I see it anyway, that what Wolfgang Ischinger called the Westlessness, so in other words, that the West is obviously uh, pulling back from areas. Uh, so you can see that in Afghanistan, uh, which is of course geographically a bit further away, but still we see even to uh, the Balkans, uh, where with regard to enlargement, uh, we are kind of uh, uh, in a frozen like Bulgaria and uh, North Macedonia, as it is correctly called now. And uh, but these countries, so that uh, so like uh, until yesterday, there was between Kosovo and Serbia, they were more or less facing a uh, conflict. But then we also see that uh, even uh, in the midst of the Balkan, the Serbian defense minister will uh, actually also meet the Russian ambassador at the border. So what I'm saying is we really have to look out as a European Union and also as the West, that in the immediate neighborhood, that not with short term, also nationally, uh, uh, motivated uh, motivations, be it the elections or economic considerations uh, through market access or competition. So we should not be put off from the foreign policy and the strategic perspective that in these countries with the Eastern partnership and especially with these three countries, these are partners who really want to achieve something together with us. And from their point of view, they also see a common future with us. And uh, I don't think in the world you'll find too many who want to share the future with us. Uh, that's why we should uh, take this seriously. And, uh, and we should also uh, look at the framework that we have uh, with the association agreements and uh, the deep and uh, comprehensive uh, free trade agreements or areas. So we have uh, a broad uh, and uh, large scale agenda. And from my point of view, it is right that uh, the fight against corruption and everything connected with it, uh, that plays a decisive role. And all the reforms that have taken place, be it the decentralization, be it in the health sector, be it in the reforms, uh, especially of uh, the judiciary, uh, also the uh, state attorneys, uh, all of that uh, can be uh, taken as the fight against corruption. And, uh, and uh, this is also included in your recommendations for action. We've got a lot of allies. So I always say that in the Ukraine and Georgia and um, Moldova, so we um, are doing these programs with the real reformers and we are the real reformers are in many parties. It's not always those who are in the government or in the government um, parties are real reformers, but there are those within these parties and also across the party, uh, the government and the opposition, there are those forces who want the reforms and also in the civil societies. And this is something that we should use. And uh, with them, we should cooperate comprehensively. So I think we should look exactly at them. And this is also uh, mentioned here in the paper, the uh, experience of the anti-corruption uh, initiative of the EU, for instance, also with regard to the Ukraine, the uh, the assistance mission is administrative. Um, so I, I can't uh, remember the correct name, mind you, but the administrative uh, uh, assistance mission, I'll just call it that. So that's supposed to help uh, in uh, certain areas uh, that are security relevant and um, to implement the reforms there. So I, I believe that uh, with regard to Moldova, where we now have a, uh, a um, not just the president, but uh, also a pro-European parliamentary uh, majority, and the country is um, sufficiently small so that uh, with intensive cooperation from us, 
we can achieve certain effects. So I would be all in favor, and I said that already to Katerina Matarnova and others, that now we should look at it and see whether for uh, Moldova, we should not have administrative assistance mission that we should set up that uh, will offer a comprehensive consultation. So Maya Sandu says uh, quite clearly, I want to have it, but I don't have the people who know and can do this. And uh, I think uh, in such a small country like Moldova, um, we could uh, actually uh, set an example to say that we are providing comprehensive administrative assistance so that what they actually want themselves and what is uh, in com uh, so also uh, in line with implementing our large uh, to scale agenda. Um, so in my middle or medium term, secret agenda is uh, that we might move to this situation that in a few years time, the uh, Moldova has uh, now become so fit that this small country is then the first candidate because then let's say there is the break of the dogma so that uh, we won't have any formal uh, membership candidates from the former uh, Soviet Union. So for me, this would be a point to say, okay, this would be a, this could, so in a few years, this could be a breakthrough. So to make clear that Europe is there too, and uh, we can be successful as well and uh, provide the people there a European perspective and the corrupt elites and i want to end with that uh, so rebecca knows the sentence uh, because i've already said that in tiflis or kiev so the corrupt elites uh, so at receptions i would like to tell them you know what i've got good news so in a functioning democracy you can be rich and uh, in line with the law but you have to have two requisites or just one prerequisite you have to sell a good product or uh, you have to offer good service. And uh, what is not enough is that you've got good connections. That is not enough in a functioning democracy. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, uh, Michael. Unfortunately, the Pandora Papers have shown that uh, in even in Western countries, you can be rich and a little bit corrupt even though you might respect the law over and above. So we could have some interesting discussions about that. Sergei Lagodinsky, probably you want to say something about the Green Deal and the proposals of Georg Zachmann. Maybe uh, Michael left it to the Green colleagues to talk about the Green Deal. What I'm also interested in is uh, a question that was addressed in Ms. Kikalishvili's paper. What is your position in Brussels? What is the majority in Brussels when it comes to this issue? Why haven't we offered Georgia and Moldova to send an administrative uh, support mission? In Moldova, there is a wish to have such a mission and some of these support initiatives that used to exist were well received in the Ukraine and had a good effect. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, uh, let me say it's a pleasure to be with you. It's a great initi initiative uh, of the Centre of Liberal Modernity. It's important. It's an important dialogue. And um, you have established already a tradition of having such a dialogue. Um, last time I was present there, uh, I was also present, and it was very interesting for me to be part of that debate. I mean, politics is always something where you have some kind of a, a tension, where you have different things we have to bridge and it's clear to everyone we need to sort of balance the things that we do on the one hand side we are talking about the europeanization we are also trying to give the perspective for societies to europeanize and on the other hand so we have to be realistic 
in terms of how far such transformation society can become a, Euro a European one. Uh, let's be quite honest. I mean, we do have a number of member states in the EU that have not yet achieved the best level when it comes to anti-corruption. And I'm not even talking about the Green Deal yet. So we have this ideal, these European ideals, and not everyone corresponds to those uh, uh, ideals. Let's look at um, Bulgaria and what was happening in Bulgaria, basically, is something that could have taken place very well outside the EU as well. The same goes for the issue that was addressed by Michael. On the one hand side, we have this deep feeling of solidarity. For us, as the Greens, we have this feeling of solidarity. We are open-minded and have solidarity vis-a-vis -vis the whole space of Eastern Europe. But on the other hand, we also see things from the perspective of geopolitics. Uh, and, and these two perspectives, if they have to be combined, can create a not very productive atmosphere. So do we say these countries are important just because we see there's a Russian sphere of influence we'd like to diminish? Strategically speaking, yes, but it's not the only reason. And that brings us to the topic of whether we'd like to talk only to the three countries that have the best perspective or shouldn't we also talk to other countries like Armenia? Should we try to be much more active in order to include Armenia? Although Armenia takes another geostrategic position. So I think it's very important uh, not to just look blindly at uh, geopolitical strategies. We should be much more transparent. We should focus on our solidarity and we should not reduce our Eastern partnership on the three countries we are talking about today. And that should be the position of Germany also in years to come. Based on these positions, of course, we have such projects as the Green New Deal. These projects create opportunities. And we, when we talk about Turkey, for instance, and, and Russia, we always say, okay, there's the Green Deal. Uh, the Green Deal should be rolled out to Turkey as well. Let's see what we can do with Russia when it comes to the Green Deal. So that's the overarching topic in uh, Europe at the moment. And it also has co repercussions on the countries that have an association agreement with us. And so when we talk about exports and imports, we should focus on these countries as, as well. And that also helps to transform the societies in those countries. And so I think the proposals that were highlighted in the study you made are very interesting and very important because they close the gap that we still see in our European neighborhood policy. The gap was the ecology, was the environment, the environment was not integrated as well as many other aspects. And so having the Green Deal would help us to close that gap in our cooperation. And that is why I consider this topic to be so relevant. Oh, you talk about the Paris solutions and also some other issues that would help the countries to address their own problems. I mean, all of this need to be duly considered. Now, 
As far as the next four years are concerned, I do not know whether the composition we have for now on stage will be the composition of stakeholders that will take final decisions. What I would have liked to see is to have a longer term outlook. Whatever the political constellation will be for the next years to come. We need to come back to a German ambitious perspective, active perspective when it comes to the European neighborhood policy. Sometimes we forget about the activity that is required. Sometimes we forget it in the middle of our troubles and tribulations we have at the moment. But I think the uh, new government, the new German government, which will come into office, can make a new start, both in terms of uh, geostrategic issues and also in terms of our global positioning for foreign policy. And when we talk about global, it's not only global. Global is always uh, regional too. And the proposals that you have submitted in the framework of your publications, your studies, can be taken on board. One could discuss them. In order to revitalize Germans' ambitions, Germany's activity regarding cooperation with Eastern countries. So I'm happy to have such an activity and, uh, and I'm going to take your debate into the ones that we are going to have when it comes to the formation of a new government. Uh, Sergei, uh, we have tried very hard to bring from Berlin the stakeholders, uh, but since uh, the election took place only a couple of uh, days ago, I couldn't get it. We couldn't get anyone from the other par parties to join this discussion. So we had to do it with the Greens only, <laughs> so to say. But of course, we know he, our role in Berlin. And we are very happy to have Mr. Ludenberg here, because we know that he is an ambitious person. And he is going to insist on the European partnership remaining high on the agenda in the Foreign Office. Thank you, Ms. Harms. Allow me to thank you once again to have presented the papers. Uh, I got a lot of interesting ideas that are going to uh, be inform my further work when it comes to the preparation of the summit in December. Mr. Lagodinsky said something very important, namely the ambitions should be high. And I think that's a good idea, but it's not just about the ambitions that we, we also have a responsibility for our Eastern partners, not only for the three countries uh, that are especially important because of the association, but we also have responsibility for the other Eastern partners. And as far as GU's strategy is concerned, uh, all the three associated countries with their territorial conflicts are there. Uh, let's think about Crimea, the Donbas, uh, Abkhazia, uh, South Ossetia, and uh, Transnistria. Uh, those are, of course, conflicts we need to have in mind, but that should not be the only stimulus. Of course, uh, it will be also for our benefit if in all six countries of the Eastern Partnerships there will be reforms when uh, the economy develops further, when human rights will receive a high priority and when we work together towards building a European, a common European house. Um, I always like to say that inclusiveness of the Eastern Partnership is very important to us. And I see no contradiction when it comes to the different levels of ambitions in the individual Eastern Partnership countries. We see it also in the association agreements, the DCFTA, the visa liberalization. Step by step, we have uh, implemented conditionality principles, principle, and we could introduce some things. And uh, there are also some uh, members of the European, of the uh, uh, Eastern Partnership who do not share the common European perspective. Uh, thanks uh, to Mr. Lagodinsky for having mentioned Armenia. We shouldn't forget that there are many people who are interested in Europe. And as I said in my statement in the beginning, we should never close the door on anyone. Now, 
during the next weeks and months, we as the German government uh, are going to be very open and transparent. We are going to look at where can we intensify our cooperation with the associated three countries. And I think that could be a kind of deepening of our cooperation. That could also be a kind of economic integration into the European Union, into the European single market. Again, as a step-by-step -step process, not everything uh, overnight. Of course, we will have to look at individual sectors. When we talk of uh, freedom of movement of businesses might be, we are going to have a more complicated situation. In the association agreements, in the DCFTA, we have already laid the foundation stone for further steps to be taken. And this is what we can do. We can look at what are the agreements, what uh, things have been theoretically ag agreed and need to be practically implemented. That would help us to overcome the skepticism we see in the member states, because some member states are afraid that we are going to, to give away more and more uh, goodies. And some countries want to be faster. And this scepticism exists not only amongst uh, the other partner countries in the EU, and there's also some scepticism on, on, on the level of the German government. But I think the countries, our partner countries could say, okay, we do not just want to have some goodies from you. We are willing and ready to embark and further develop uh, the cooperation mechanisms that we have agreed on. We should have it quantifiable, measurable, and we could have some control instruments uh, in the run-up of uh, the summit. We already talked about the judicial reform. It's very difficult to measure the judicial reform and the progress, but having confidence in uh, the own judicial system is a good yardstick that we could use, and that would help our colleagues in Brussels also to measure the progress made. Then we also need a clear-cut analysis of the reforms that we have uh, under conducted so far. We have asked the Commission to do some kind of mapping of the reforms, what has been achieved and what are the next steps that the association countries would like to take. Maybe this can be summarized in a single document and maybe we could name all those individual steps. And there again, we need the proposals coming from our association countries. They need to tell us what's important for them. Of course, it's not so, so easy to agree on priorities because we are talking about three countries, but having the trio structure is very good. Of course, every country can uh, formulate its own priorities. Conditionality should uh, remain a central element. Well, that goes without saying, that is absolutely clear. Let me say a few, a few words about security. Security was mentioned as well. We are willing and ready here in Berlin to think about security in the framework of the Eastern Partnership and how it could be uh, reflected. We have the European Peace Facility. It's a new instrument we always wanted to have and we are going to use it now. Um, that does not necessarily mean we are going to send major military missions, but they are fields of uh, security that are quite problematic for us as well, like cyber security and other areas. Another perspective uh, was mentioned several times, although we didn't want to talk about it. It's the idea of taking the progress made in the association crate. They are not a replacement for um, an accession perspective. Of course, an expect accession perspective must be there. It, what we have achieved so far shows the country's willingness to undergo reforms, the success achieved, and of course the EU should also provide something in return, like a deepened cooperation, climate and energy. I'm not going to talk much about the content of the paper, let me just remind you that, uh, for instance, with Ukraine, I'm not going to mention Nord Stream 2 now, but uh, we have a joint de declaration that we have negotiated together with the United States, and it goes back to many of these areas. We have mentioned the Green Fund, the transition, and the idea behind all of that is we can turn the Ukraine into a country which is not just dependent on transit income from energy. It could become an export of green energy, could become an exporter of hydrogen energy. That is our common goal. Whether everybody in the Ukraine shares that goal, I don't know, but at least the people we talk to, our colleagues from the Ministry of Economic Affairs, they share this goal. So it would be a success story if the Ukraine became an exporter of energy to Europe. So, with the 
domestic market. I mean, uh, we've already got a lot in the association uh, agreement. We can go the first um, steps into the single market. So we, uh, I've got some suggestion what we're doing in part, and so building capacity in the countries. Uh, so especially next week for instance we've got an, another uh, delegation from the three associated countries to berlin to uh, also to get some uh, promotion and uh, to discuss this and we want to deepen these uh, connections and it's very helpful and but uh, so with moldova we've also got a specific program from diaspora to get experts who will go back again and uh, this is a, a central element i think uh, which we like to support and it's often also about a recognition a certificate for certain industrial products that come from the associated uh, countries or from eastern partnership countries uh, to uh, recognize that in europe there's a lot of progress uh, there and also judicial reform of course we also want to support uh, with uh, expertise and consultation and maybe also one thing, uh, what Victoria Rosa said fittingly, we need patience. Patience on both sides, I think, and uh, patience that uh, our concept of Green Deal is maybe not understood right away or internalized. And in some areas, we uh, might uh, tend to overtax the partners, but uh, please also have patience on some processes in uh, Brussels and like the predecessors know that um, is not quite as fast as we would wish for that because we have to take on board every 27, every one of the 27 member countries because with all the documents that are signed, all uh, votes count. And uh, I want to close with a remark that what is important is uh, the rule of law. And in Brussels, we're going to insist on that. And it's not just in our interest that this is uh, something that serves the interests of the people in these countries and uh, that they can also say this is a state as I imagine it to be. Thank you very much. So with regard to the rule of law, I'd like to remind you that in the center of Maidan in 2013 and 14, there was really the uh, desire for the rule of law and to establish this rule of law and the situation that every citizen is equal uh, and in court and in the law. And uh, there have been steps made, and uh, but there's still some uh, distance to cover. And this is true for all three countries. And that's why I think it's important that it remains a priority. Michael Gala wanted to say something. At least I can see the yellow hand. Yes, right. That's my yellow hand. So thank you very much. So there's so many aspects that have been, uh, especially in the judicial era. So I do believe that in part you can measure that uh, if it goes in the right direction. For instance, uh, also uh, in the, uh, with regard to our uh, staff, so we've got a national anti-corruption office of the Ukraine, for instance, that pr uh, prepared something that, and there's a high anti-corruption court that uh, will um, address certain uh, cases. And also with the constitutional court and the Supreme Court uh, there in choosing the, um, so, I mean, not to have a veto right, but to, to be able to influence the choice with regard uh, to the staff selected. And then from the top to the bottom, uh, the reforms are uh, undertaken. So I think there's a certain measure there. And, um, and also with regard to uh, the uh, state attorney and uh, so that we can arrive at this kind of uh, condition. You talked about the security and I'll just say it bluntly. So I'm with Robert Harbeck, uh, what he said. And that is, I believe, um, so there's also some EU countries and also the United States generally. So uh, countries like Ukraine, we should uh, deliver defensive weapons, period. And I think we can afford it politically to have a Russian aggression, to wait for a, a Russian aggression. And that's why I believe that this is a point we should discuss. Also a, a new federal government. And I uh, believe that even the Greens, like uh, Robert Habeck is a good example for that. They've had their experience in the Balkans and, uh, so, and uh, Gunther, uh, uh, Joshka Fischer uh, was attacked with a uh, paint uh, bag by that for that uh, position. But these are debates we have to have also in Berlin and not uh, just uh, say no by a rote. But otherwise you're right. Um, so everything in this area uh, should be uh, discussed and uh, decided unanimously. It would be good if Germany would be in uh, the state that ha uh, in, in a debate uh, that have uh, more ambitious ideas like uh, the Baltic countries, the Poles in, in this area. I would wish for that from the new federal government, whatever the composition is. And then we still have a discussion with France. But if we start 
if from the outset we are amongst those countries who don't have any ambitious plans, then I think uh, we're not going to make any progress. So I've got uh, concerns uh, when I look at the draft uh, for the uh, summary uh, documents for the Balkans. So it's just more of the same. And uh, it's the same, the same uh, pre. Uh, so the uh, same problems also in France. So if we don't make any progress there, uh, then um, I am asking myself, how are we going to do it in the other sectors? Uh, but I also believe that indeed, because we've got a broad and deep agenda, so there's a lot you can do. And one argument is what I do want to bring forward, and that is so uh, in the trio countries, when there's so much desperation about uh, what we are doing. So I say, do your work, implement whatever's there, and uh, a formal status, uh, like a candidate status, doesn't say anything, doesn't mean anything. The Macedonians have uh, noticed that painfully for 25 years, uh, so when they had a uh, debate with uh, Greece, but a, a country like uh, Turkey, like uh, we are negotiating since the 3rd of October 2005, not because of our fault, but uh, uh, Turkey, I mean, they're farther away from uh, the EU than 2005, so in other words, Formal statuses, uh, whatever the plural is, won't help or uh, say little. So when you do your work and uh, when you make yourself as attractive that we say one day, so we would be daft if we wouldn't uh, give these countries a clear perspective and a membership at the end of the day. This is where you need to go and then uh, we can achieve a lot with the existing agenda. So these, so I would wish for, so if from Berlin, you would have some encouraging words so that uh, also just uh, go to the article 49 that there is such an article 49 thank you very much thank you and uh, so uh, thank you also for the uh, request to berlin that uh, in the coalition uh, negotiations whoever talks with one another that security and foreign policy should uh, be uh, talked in clear words so i've heard that there's one person who would ask a question from the audience Good evening. I'm uh, Michael Sarjadzic, and uh, I work uh, for a foundation for policy. So I want to ask about conditionality. And uh, as we've seen, the conditionality doesn't always work. And the current example is Georgia. So the country uh, will do without the macro financial help, which they wouldn't have gotten anyway, because the judicial reforms were insufficiently conducted. So my question is, so what uh, path uh, the EU should take in order to uh, then include the associated partners? And I've got a second question, if I may, and that is, uh, so Katya, in your paper, you also mentioned that uh, the Eastern Partnership is a global project. And uh, so my question is whether uh, this is also regarded like this in Berlin and Brussels. So I can think of two things. One point is that uh, the membership perspective of the Eastern Partnership was always uh, or strictly separate from the Eastern Partnership. And the second is the Karabakh uh, war, where the European uh, Union actually failed as a partner. So thank you very much. Das Mikrofon dazu gleich weiter. Aber, um, ich würde gerne dazu sagen, so I'll pass on the uh, mic, uh, but I'd say that the Eastern Partnership, right from the beginning, I accompanied uh, as a European uh, Parliament member, and also uh, I was responsible also for uh, all the countries in the Eastern Partnership. And I must say that right from the outset is that the countries decided to take different journeys. and. Uh, we have a situation now with very different uh, agreements and i believe that um, the difference regardless of how you see the goals of eastern partnership generally but that the difference of the agreements that have been concluded that they will lead to different levels of commitment in these uh, countries i would say that i so I also know and follow the social uh, developments in Azerbaijan and uh, Belarus, and uh, I'm very closely connected with people in these countries. And I know that success or failure 
in the three associated countries uh, has considerable influence on what is happening in the other uh, countries of the Eastern Partnership. So, and I believe that, uh, for instance, it was good that there was a kind of thawing um, period uh, towards uh, Belarus when there was some signs that uh, the situation was not improving. And in that phase of thawing, that there was more exchange, more encounters that this was triggered, uh, that um, was welcomed in the West uh, as, uh, yeah, as a peaceful, uh, as the attempt of a peaceful uh, um, uprising against the Lukashenko regime. But I'd like to also pass it on to Mr. Lutenberg. Sorry, I think it's okay with the mic. So I don't know whether this uh, mic is needed for the... Uh, well, if you can ask, uh, understand me like this, then I'll try it. So there's different uh, points that you mentioned also with regard to Georgia. So maybe this is a question to the colleagues from Brussels rather. But when you want to hear what I think is, uh, uh, Michel uh, had a uh, mediating attempt that he undertook. And so there was the April agreement, and that was a very important uh, step to get the tension between uh, the opposition and uh, the urgent dream. And I thought the regional elections was uh, quite uh, good. And uh, so the situation has uh, kind of calmed down again. And uh, we'll have to see with Sakashavili what uh, is uh, in store in the future. But I thought it was justified and uh, maybe not right away, but maybe in the medium, medium term, uh, this uh, has contributed to the uh, relaxation. Uh, but in how far the EU uh, should be the fire uh, fighters in such crisis situation. We know Albania, for instance, we had a similar situation also with a good success. So I think that if uh, the uh, EU uh, is actively looking after the neighborhood, that's right. And if the uh, party, uh, the uh, parties want to sit um, down with the EU and uh, make agreements, of course, I uh, appreciate that. And uh, what you mentioned, the uh, other membership partners and the perspective of the membership, you said that quite rightly, uh, Mrs. Harms. Um, so uh, their expectations are different and our expectations are different with regard to these countries. So, um, so what you described as a thawing period in Belarus didn't lead to further uh, success like a moratorium with a death penalty, for instance, and other things, or membership in the European Council. So these would have been things that would have helped us. But uh, the thawing period uh, uh, did lead to the situation that people in Belarus understood that the EU is also interested with us. There was valuable contacts that developed and uh, also uh, exist in this period, in this difficult period. So uh, many people know that Brussels is not the demon like Lukashenko says, but we can also talk uh, properly with them. And um, so with regard to Nagorno-Karabakh, so the uh, role of the EU, is, so, uh, as a German uh, diplomat, you're suffering from the fact that EU is Germany. So even though we're part of the Minsk group, we were not a player there. And uh, so uh, we are co-chair of the Minsk group. But at the end of the day, the Russians did it alone. So the November peace agreement, uh, which I did welcome uh, because it stopped the dying. So uh, but that showed us uh, that we as the EU uh, would need to have a stronger position. So afterwards we tried uh, to uh, catch up. There was important trips, some European colleagues. And uh, I believe that um, uh, we didn't learn uh, that we need to undertake and develop more activity. And that's what we want to do as the EU, as well as uh, Germany. Thank you. There's one more, one more uh, word coming from the floor, Maria Luisa, and then I hand over to Sergei. Let me say something from the German perspective once again. Let me try to sort of destroy a bit of that harmony uh, that uh, we are seeing. We want to invite you all, this unity, we want to bring you all to Europe. I mean, behind all of that, there's some things that are never said. It's about geopolitics. It is about geopolitics and it needs to be about geopolitics then. The EU and Germany in, in particular dislike the work word geopolitics. It sounds like power claims, like geographical, or to say it even in more clearer words, imperial claims. And the EU and all the more so Germany without tradition and our historical responsibility for us 
it's an expression of a very ethical attitude not to get involved into this kind of power play or geopolitical power play. We'd like to bring good proposals. We'd like to give support. We'd like to talk about transformation. We'd like to also give support when it comes to climate, because here we have made some progress already. So we are the ones that come with the good things and we do not come with the bad things like the military. And it was just mentioned now. what happened to our party chairman when he encountered a reality. A, there are realities like a front and that we do not have one front only. We have three fronts in those countries and they have something to do with a neighbor, geographical neighbor, and at the same time adv adversary that uses military. And for us, it's so difficult to cope with that. And we are going to see that over the next months in Germany, all the more so. We have this traumatic attitude, this traumatic relationship. As soon as we talk about using the military, the right to self-defense, I was mentioned by Mr. Gala. It is absolutely right. There is a right of, to self-defense. The question just is, what do you defend yourself with? And in Bosnia, we as the Green Party have learned a lesson. We have learned in Bosnia, a nation cannot defend itself if it has no means to do so. So the question is then, what do you do? Do you protect this people? Do you use all the institutions you have? Do you use the military? Uh, do you bring in all these uh, structures from the outside? We have tried to do that by, by the United Nations and they failed over a long time to do something for Bosnia. So what do we talk about now? Does it mean we are instigating? We're fueling a war if we provide defensive uh, assets when we focus on the rights to self-defense. And maybe these instruments might help to end the war instead of starting a war. This is such a difficult discussion. We as the Greens, the Social Democrats, the Liberals, they all had the same debates. I remember in Bremen, we got an an application from DVU, uh, DVU, a right-wing party, no German blood for other people's interests. So it's a very difficult debate that we have in Germany. And we try to sort of circumvent such a debate. And there comes Michael Gala now and confronts us a bit. And it's not only Michael Gala that confronts us, it's also reality that we get confronted with. And of course, we might be still able to close our eyes on reality for a short while, but the countries that uh, have embarked on the path to freedom, they can never close their eyes on reality. Now, uh, I get the mic now. I'm not going to give it away again. I just hand over once to our colleagues from Brussels and uh, I give the floor to Sergei now. Let me say, um, Maria Luisa, wonderful to hear you, uh, as always, passionate and absolutely precise. But let me make it even more precise. I think there is a difference between our desire, a desire that we all share for Germany to have a, or the EU at least, to think more geostrategically. And we want Europe not only to think, but also to act geostrategically. And um, there is the term geostrategic project. For me, the Eastern Partnership is not a geostrategic project. Because that would mean we would instrumentalize those countries. And I don't think this is what our project of the Eastern Partnership is all about. Eastern Partnership 
I mean, it may sound a bit um, high strung, but for me, it's a project of freedom. It's about fostering this process of uh, freedom, expanding, not enlarging Germany or uh, the European Union. It's about enlarging the space of freedom. Combined to that, with that, I would also say the Eastern Partnership for me is a project of empathy and of a strong link to those countries. Of course, we have to include geostrategic things into our thinking. We, of course, don't cannot afford to be naive and to get, get tricked by the Kremlin. But I'd be very cautious. I would not say that uh, this project can be seen just from the angle of geostrategy. Because in a geostrategic project, usually the people concerned do not play a major role, but they have to play a major role in everything we do. So it's not just about creating spheres of influence, widening our space where we have a say. We want to have this project for the benefit of the people who live there. And so the term, the Eastern Partnership as a geostrategic problem could be misinterpreted and that would be a real pity. No matter how you call this project, there are the three countries that have signed association agreements and they do have a far-reaching strategic decision that was taken firmly and they pay a price for having taken that decision and so no matter what the Germans call this project from the perspective of the East, this st decision was a strategic decision and for all we know inside the EU in most states, the Eastern Partnership is seen as a strategic instrument, even though they don't call it like that. And uh, very often they don't call it a strategic pro project because of the German speaking space in the EU. And I think this has to be discussed as well in the future. And I also think uh, that we do have a confrontation inside the EU. And it has something to do with the Nord Stream decision and it has something to do with the current developments regarding the pipelines. The current pipeline policy, uh, this debate is going to become much sharper. At the end of our event, let's say we can always uh, have a wonderful debate on strategy geostrategic affairs. I think we should really look at the papers that we have introduced today. We should look at the uh, proposals, have a discussions about it, and we should be and, be and remain reliable partners for our Eastern European partners. I would like to thank you for uh, your attention in Brussels, in Tbilisi, in uh, uh, Chisinau and uh, in Kiev and thanks to everyone here in Berlin uh, this week. I'm, by the way, I'm not in Brussels, I'm in Strasbourg. Bye-bye. <laughs>